the years, marketers have been analyzing the different generations, baby boomers, Gen X, millennials. And recently we have seen there's a red thread among all of them, speed. They all want everything to happen now. My name is Francisco Serrano, and I am the Chief Speed Officer at One to One and the host of the Now Gen podcast. Join me. Each episode, we talk about what's happening with brands, see how brand professionals across different industries cope with this fast changing market, and live up to the expectation of this now generation. Welcome. This episode is brought to you by One to One. The fastest day-to-day -day design and content studio. For more than 17 years, One to One has been their premier partner for many Fortune 500 companies, proving that tight deadlines shouldn't be a hassle. Hello, and welcome again to the NowGen podcast. We will be talking today about the new value proposition agencies must offer now to the global brands. That is a challenge that all global brands are having right now. So it's going to be an interesting topic. And for that, we have a very special guest. His name is Gabriel Schmidt. He is the Chief Creative Officer of FCB New York. He has a vast experience in creative strategies and interactive advertising. He's a seasoned creative professional with an MBA uh, at the Berlin School of uh, Creative Leadership. He's multi, yes, you heard right, multi-award winner at the Cannes, and uh, his work is featured at the New York Times, NBC, ABC, Fast Company, and many other media outlets. So you better get your uh, ears together because you're going to learn a lot in this session. Thank you very much for being here, Gabriel. Thank you so much for having me. I love, I love that you better get your ears together. It's a good one. I'm going to steal this one. <laughs> <laughs> you know sometimes they're connected to the brain and that is going to be something useful well yeah thank you for being here and before we get started why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself your career i know that you're originally from brazil and tell us a little bit about that yeah i'm i'm co-cco at uh, fcb new york so i share the creative responsibilities there with michael and matt my partner um, I've been in, uh, yes, I'm, I am from Brazil. I've been in the U.S. since 2012. Um, I worked for four years at FCB Chicago, where I started as a, a mid-level creative. Um, before that, I had worked in Brazil for seven years, maybe. But then, you know, came, came to Chicago um, as a mid-level creative in 2012 and worked there for four years. Uh, moved to New York to work at KBS. Uh, for a brief period of time uh, and then moved back to FCB uh, for FCB New York in 2016. Um, and, and here we are. Oh, you're awesome. And, and I see that you have a lot of work uh, going on with a lot of big brands. So I'm, I'm sure you're going to tell us a little bit about that in, in just uh, in just the time. I mean, it, it, it was just uh, time for the Cannes Festival, right? I mean, it just passed. Yep. Tell us your experience about that. Um, in general, of how can goes and how important it is for the industry, or or this specifically this past one. Your experience as a as a professional going there, or having your work feature there, and uh, and specifically for the brands or the industry, what what role it plays in in the whole you know advertising and messaging world. Yeah, it's incredibly important. Um, because it's that time of the year or is the pinnacle of the time of, of, of the year where, you know, we as a industry celebrate the most important work uh, that is happening around the world. Um, in the last few years, I think the Ken Lions did a very good job on, on course correcting some of the trends that we were seeing before where not work that was uh, really helping brands, but the work that was only created for creative sake was winning. And, and I feel like it's been a few years where, you know, the, the, the biggest awards go to brands and to ideas that really move the needle from a, from a, obviously first and foremost, from a creative point of view, but that really bring tangible business results to the brands. 
and what that caused was that it became a much more interesting you know celebration of also for the clients and for the people who are working on the brand so what you're seeing can now is there's almost as many <laughs> brand people as there is there are creatives and agency people there and i think that's super positive because we always say that I've seen in New York that we don't, you know, we're not creatives or creative leads. We are truly business partners of our clients. Um, and and I think that having a having the biggest advertising festival reflecting that is 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 is, is important and only makes the whole thing more health, healthier. Because um, if I don't wear if I don't have my, you know, our heart in the right place, so to speak, if the agenda is not, you know, the same between agencies and brands, then the work is just not going to be amazing. So celebrating the right kind of work uh, uh, at the biggest stage, I think it's, it's super important. And, you know, it becomes a thing where you see a lot of people that you kind of never see during the year. You Everyone gathers in Cannes and, and meet each other. So it's also very important <laughs> for the for the social sociability of it. Um, and it's something that we all look forward to do. So it's 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 very important. Yeah, I would imagine that it could be interesting to see all the creatives connecting, and that conversation would be very very interesting to see all those genius minds getting together and trying to figure out what what is the the next step of of going above and beyond, right? Yeah. So uh, I mean, you guys had I have notes here one Grand Prix five. You, you've been five golden lions, five silver lions, three bronze lions. What does that, I mean, an award-winning professional like you, how, how I, I, I've seen your work. And I went to your, your page and it's amazing. And I like particularly the example of last year, how you guys connected with the, with the, the, the Burger King ad, you know, the guy that stands up and yeah, yeah, yeah. it's, just you, you connect with the audience and it, and it was something that was happening now and and, and I, I think you you com, you you mentioned in one of your interviews that that you had something different planned and you had to react and, and and so can you explain a little bit about that and the evolution of now where is Burger King and I just pick that as an example but if you have any other examples feel the, the idea is to to bring the now generation alive and how you have to connect with that yeah i think the pandemic you know with all the awful things that it brought it also brought us a few interesting opportunities to rethink our approach into into the obviously into the world into work at large but also marketing communication wise what happened with that idea for burger king uh which is called uh, stay home of the whopper was that it was i think we launched that idea on april of 2020 uh up until that point April or May, up until that point, everything that was going out in the world was very monotone, you know, very sad pianos and 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 voiceovers saying we're gonna go for this together, which I totally understand. And and it made sense, I think, in the beginning of the pandemic, because everyone was so lost and reacting to, you know, that massive shift into our collective lives. That it's understandable that we were, all the brands were trying to, you know, send messages of of strength and and and, and care, so to speak. But it became very um, um, tiring very quickly, right? Because every you you would turn you will go on YouTube or Instagram or turn on the TV, and everything was all, 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 always the same. Um, we had that campaign for breaking in the in the in the can. We had shot that that film already, and it was gonna we're gonna use that film for something else, for something different, a different promotion, and we had, that it had been created pre pandemic. Um, when we saw everything that was happening, obviously with pandemic once, and then second with how the brands were behaving, uh, we kind of had the the idea of okay, what if we repurpose what we're doing here, and and go towards you know what people were more needing now <laughs> which is yes what is the reinforcement but doing it through the lenses of the brand and through through the tone of the brand and, and maybe have a go go out in the world with something that feels fresher and then a little bit more authentic to what burger king is rather than doing everything you know the same way that everyone else was doing which is when we re-edited the film 
uh, and, and, and launched uh, probably the first campaign in the world during pandemic that was not, you know, a sad piano thing and, and had a different tone. It was a risky move. Not risky, I'll say it was a brave move um, uh, because it could have, you know, it's a fine line between making sure people are engaged in the message and not having fun with the message. And again, the pandemic is not the most comfortable place to do that, you know, to ask people to have fun within a message. Uh, but I think we were in the right side of the line and, and worked incredibly well and, 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 and became kind of a famous thing out there in the world. So it was, was very fun. The other thing that we did during pandemic that was very much, uh, now, <laughs> uh, uh, was this idea for uh, Nicola Botra called Nicola Botra courtside, where, you know, the day before New York went into lockdown, a few of us were in the, in the, at FCB, at the FCB office, and we were discussing, you know, what is going to happen. And we saw that LeBron James had given an interview the night before uh, when the NBA announced that they were canceling the season and the reported that uh, canceling the season. And if they were to come back, would be without fans. And and the LeBron says, "Well, without fans, I ain't playing." We saw that, and we. we we're like, well, Mikhail Abotri stands for joy, and we have been saying it's only worth it if you enjoy it for a few years. That sounds like a perfect <laughs> uh, opportunity, so to speak, to to you know expand on that message, which is when we so we created the, the idea of okay, what if you wrapped all the courts, uh, the NBA courts with screens and and have people fans watching the games from anywhere in the world, because the most important thing in sports is not sports in itself, nor the fans itself, nor the athletes it's, uh, themselves. It's actually the symbiotic relationship we think between fans and athletes, right? That's where the the you know the most the most interesting things are born, and and which and, and then they did obviously crazy, um, and and we had no idea if we were able to do it, but we, you know, I literally texted the, my the clients on 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 the ABI side. Uh, with the idea, they said, "Okay, let's try, it, let's go," um, and and we started developing it quickly. We went to uh, Michael Abolch and ABI went to the NBA. They were already talked to Microsoft, who, who was their their tech partner, um, and the three companies came together. And in four months, uh, Courtside was born, which was incredibly quick for such a huge, you know, production uh, uh, outtake, and. But it happened, and and, and it, the cool thing was that it lasted throughout the whole season. So courtside was there for one hundred and twenty, all the one hundred twenty-seven, I think, games um, uh, throughout, throughout the NBA. So it was something that was, I think, was back, going back to the theme of the of the podcast. Something that we we literally reacted to what was happening, and were able to to jump ahead and, and bring something to the world that had never been done before. On both cases, on, on Burger King as well, but I think on courtside in an even bigger societal way. Which is really cool. Yeah, I think that uh, the creative of that adapting to, I mean, besides the personal situation that everybody had, you know, facing the pandemic, but not only that, but also the brands were facing also a difficult, critical moment. And the creative needs to come from somewhere. And as as I was uh, thinking to myself, I, I used to work for CNA, Seuna. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I remember that uh, advertising was spectacular in back in Brazil, right? Mm -hmm. You know, the Sebastião mm -hmm. Aparecido. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, Ricky Martin and Giselle Bündchen. And there's something about Brazilians, right, in the creative world. I don't know. That's kind of everything is like there are personalities and celebrities over there. I remember yeah. that. Uh, uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? I mean, why is that? Is yeah, I, I've, I've, this question was, was asked to me so many times because it, it is true. I think in the 80s and the 90s, there were some celebrities, so, some advertising people there that kind of broke, you know, the, you know, the, the marketing world and became well known society like as, uh, across society there. And I think that the reason is, I'm, I don't really know why, honestly. But what I do know is that Brazilians have always loved advertising, and were always interested in in the in the you know the little relief that you know good commercials at that point you know at that time would give 
to whatever it was that they were watching and also you know to their lives and people people in brazil are super akin to like jingles and and visual stuff um and there was a couple of of ad people there that that you know appeared you know one right one right after the other one hired the other actually which is washington oliveto and then is in one high school um honestly made the most out of it and made the most out of you know how famous the the, the companies that their agencies were doing were and started inserting themselves into bigger you know conversations on like late night shows and stuff like that and they were good with, they were good on camera and they were interesting people and 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 I think you know we're really good at you know speaking their truth, so to speak. And uh, then things you know got more. It started becoming famous. And then those 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 magazines, like the, the the people magazines of the world, or like in Brazil's Revista Caras and and stuff like that, they started being portrayed on those places, and their lifestyles started being imitated, and so forth and so on. And then they became kind of celebrities. Then a few years later, there was this guy who who used to run YNR in Brazil um and and he became the first uh apprentice uh, host so he was our first trump so to speak uh in uh, in what pertains to apprentice uh and and then he became incredibly famous as well you know he's famous there too today i think he's still uh, hosted a tv show in brazil if i'm not, if I'm not, I'm not mistaken mm-hmm. um so there was this aura there and when i started almost 20 years ago now 18 years ago Everyone in my generation, or not everyone, but a lot of people in my generation were all trying to do advertising for whatever reason. The industry there is very, very, very small, but also very strong. Sao Paulo is specifically where most of the main agencies are. There are there, there aren't a lot of them. There are maybe 20 when I started, you know. So that means you had 20 internship slots. <laughs> it's hard. It's very hard, which made everyone work really, really, really hard since they were we were all, we were all very young the competition was pretty pretty bad but then a lot of good people were formed and then and what happened i think that's and I, a few of us you know came to you know left brazil early in our careers and i think we kind of paved the way to other people who then said oh so i can do interesting things outside that abroad as well so the other people came came along and all this is you know we're all over the world <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's it's incredible how how you find like matches that just behave in a certain way, and and uh, piggybacking on that, I wanted to ask you uh, in this fast paced world, we were talking offline about the now gen. What it means is that they take pride in instant gratification, and they uh-huh. want the results now. What's your process like when you're uh, creating a message? And to and coming back to the title of our what's the value proposition that the agency should bring in order to make that instant gratification or the now generation pop and and, and react like the examples you gave in the pandemic times. I think uh, it, you know there, there's it, first of all it's very hard because to be reactive you have to to have a, a very good machine and then be thinking on your feet which is hard on itself already but it's something that you know the best places and agencies and in houses they they have it they have the the, the the machine is there that allows us to do things like quartzite for example uh and way smaller things that you can react quickly and and really build upon whatever is going on 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 the in in the world i think even harder is not to be reactive though and to instead of reacting to what's going on in pop culture is to really shape pop culture that's the, that's the hardest one and to do that you really need to be akin to what the trends are and what it's not bubbling it up or it's bubbling but it's not above the surface yet so you can kind of bring it up and and then make it explode uh that's much much harder uh but when you get to those things is is is, is amazing because i think that you 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 start having a kind of conversation with, with with the audience that is even more interesting because sometimes they don't even know what they want or or they didn't knew they wanted to have that kind of conversation with a brand but if you start that uh you you and you jump ahead uh the, the trends that is and we end up creating them which is great and fcb you always try to do messages that are both timeless and timely um um you know 
timeless in taking the Michael Laboto example is it's only worth it if you enjoy it. Our platform with the brand exists to bring uh, to counterbalance the, the the world of performance and bring and remember people that it's only worth it if you enjoy it. So that's our timeless I you know platform. But for all that, we bring timely things that to your point, you know, uh, react to what's going on in the world. Port side again mean a good example of that, or you know, and, and way smaller things in port side as well. So I think it's about really, really building the machine that allow you to do that, uh, to being reactive. But that stable stakes, the harder one is to actually, you know, shape what what the conversation will be. Um, it's not always that we're able to do that at all. Uh, when I say we, I don't even mean I don't even mean FCB. I mean in the industry. But sometimes, you know, we get it right, and 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 it's a lot of fun. Yes, and, and it connects and it goes and people interact and, and make the brand smarter and make a difference. Wow, that's great. Well, I know you have a very tight schedule, so thank you for that. Before we close it up, uh, I wanted to ask you if is there any other message that you want to give out to brands and or professionals dealing with brands with the now generation uh you mentioned courage you mentioned a lot of things here what is the key takeaway that they should take in order to to fulfill that connection with the audience <clears throat> to me it's all predicated on partnership um if you are uh, working on a brand and you have an agency you gotta know that nine times out of ten the people at the agency are really trying their best to partner with you and to come up with things that will be memorable and, and, and hopefully groundbreaking. I think the more space you give to the relationship uh, and the more you make sure the agendas are aligned, um, the more you're going to get to amazing results. You know, we, I, I cherish deeply, you know, the relationships we have with some of my clients. Uh, because we went to the trenches together and it's not easy. You have a lot of tough conversations, even, even though you like the person, you have, you, know, you put the person a lot up to the side and have tough conversations about the business or about processes and whatnot, but you, you always end up in a better place than you were before. And you leave the place better than you entered. Um, we're all partners in this. We all want the same things. And, and there is a world, which again, a lot of agencies prove out there show out there and can like i said in the beginning is is really showcasing where the best creative ideas are the ones that bring the better uh, the best business results and then everyone wins great yeah it's interesting how in the end relationship good strong relationships between humans is what really makes the world go around right yeah, well, it is yeah well thank you very much well thank you gabriel uh uh, is anywhere uh, a good place if anybody wants to reach out to you? Uh, LinkedIn, is it a good place? Or? Yeah, of course. Find me on LinkedIn and message me and I'm happy to, to talk. Okay, great. Well, uh, we're going to wrap this one out. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining us. We'll be talking to uh, Gabriel Schmidt. He's the co-chief creative officer at uh, FCV New York. And uh, if you want to learn more about the relevant brands, what they're doing to connect to the now gen, stay tuned and tune up to the next episode. So thank you very much. And we'll be in touch.